Okay, so before we um, dive right in here, um, I want to welcome everyone um, in coming to this session. Um, you know, it's something that uh, we put together just in the last couple of weeks. We really wanted to recognize this moment in time that's happening in our world right now with the Black Lives Matter movement um, and everything else that's going on as well. Um, and we really wanted to bring the portfolio together and founders together in a safe place um, so that we can, you know, discuss and have a conversation. And I thought, you know, it would be great um, to reach out to my good friend, Stacy, uh, who I worked with at TaskRabbit for many years, who's now the CEO there. Um, her and I have, you know, spent a lot of time at TaskRabbit thinking about building a diverse culture, um, d &I and all kinds of different things. But I mean, I think also it's just really important to take a step back um, and be able to talk as a group openly about what's been happening and not only recognize this moment in time, but ask what can we do as founders, as CEOs. Um, and I thought bringing Stacy in would help us um, just get a great perspective um, and to ask questions and um, to to just contribute um, to to the momentum and to to what's happening. Um, so I wanted to do a couple things. So one, I wanted to keep the group fairly small. So I wanted to keep it really intimate. Um, you know, I wanted to create a space where we could have, you know, a much needed sort of deeper conversation. Um, you know, we, we wanted to set a few ground world rules to have the discussion. So one is consider this a safe space and feel free to ask questions as we go. You can chat them to Jamie, but you can raise your hand, we'll unmute you. Um, be open to being uncomfortable. A lot of these conversations are uncomfortable. They should be uncomfortable, uh, but it's really great that we're having them. So be okay with that. Um, and just be open to listening to new ideas and, and perspectives. Of course, be respectful. Um, and I think, you know, being vulnerable too and speaking from our own experiences and sharing stories and experiences that are relevant to us um, is really important instead of, you know, making generalizations, which may or may not apply um, to everyone. So with that, um, oh, one other thing is, well, I'll, I'll read Stacy's bio first and I'll introduce Stacy. Um, and so, Stacy is an expert at building large, scaling, mission-minded organizations. She leads TaskRabbit as CEO. We're incredibly lucky, lucky to have her as CEO. And during her tenure at TaskRabbit, she's expanded its presence into over 70 markets across the US, the UK, Canada, France, Germany, and Spain. And she's continuing to expand the company across Europe and North America. In addition to shaping the future of work, TaskRabbit is now a core driver of the e-commerce and services strategy for the world's largest furniture retailer with the mission of making everyday life easier for everyone. Prior to joining TaskRabbit, she spent almost a decade at Google heading online sales and operations, including serving as the head of online sales and operations for Google India. Stacy sits on the board for HP, for Nordstrom, and for Black Girls Code. Um, and I'll mention that for everyone that has joined the discussion today, we're going to make a $100 donation on your behalf to Black Girls Code. Um, it's an awesome organization that we're really excited to support. She's a champion of diversity and inclusion and a frequent speaker on the empowerment of women and minorities in global business and technology. Originally, Stacy's from Detroit, where she developed a deep love for all things Motown, uh, which I can attest to. I've seen it in action. Uh, she resides in the Bay Area with her husband and her two daughters. She holds a BS in economics from the Wharton School of Business and an MBA from Stanford. 
So welcome, Stacy. Thank you so much for joining. Thank this, you. Yeah, this discussion. It's awesome to have you here. Um, so just to kind of get started, I wanted to share um, a personal story about meeting Stacy. Um, we've known each other. Oh boy. <laughs> we've known each other a long, long time. Okay. Um, many years. Uh, we originally met actually when her first daughter was, I think Emma was five weeks old. Mm -hmm. and you were on maternity leave from Google. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I was going through my first hiring of a C-level exec, which was a misfire and I uh, made a mistake there. But over a year and a half later, I sought out Stacy again a second time because I was so impressed with her the first time. And we started to build a long lasting friendship and relationship. And um, she eventually came on a COO to TaskRabbit. And I remember one of the first, um, first discussions we had was we took a walk in South Park together. And I don't know if you remember this, but we were just talking about, <laughs> you know, you had just joined and I was like, let's talk about like your five-year goals and your plan. And, you know, I said like someday, you know, I want to be able to kind of like pass the reins to someone I really trust and like hoping that person is you. And, um, and it, it took what, like four years or so, and we were both sort of ready and you really stepped up and, um, it's just been awesome to see you take the company to the next level. And I'm just so proud of everything that you and I did there together, but I'm even more proud of what you've done there. Um, since you've taken over full time. So uh, it's been an awesome journey and I'm excited to dig in with you here and with this amazing group of founders we have as part of the Fuel Pool por portfolio. Thank you. Well, thank you for that story. I do remember that walk and I do remember you saying that and it wasn't even part of the goal. It was, I was just excited to work with you um, and we, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Yes, we did. So I'm happy to be here. We can take this conversation wherever you all want to go with it. Cool. Well, let's just kick off by letting me ask you, like, how are you feeling right now? How are you feeling? How are you feeling about this time? Like, what's going through your head? What's going through your mind? Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big question. Um, sometimes people say, how are you fine? And, and I'm not fine. So, so you know, the, the short answer is I'm not fine. Um, it's, it's a really challenging time for our society right now. And it's especially so for black people. Um, and, you know, when someone asks me how I'm doing, I process every experience of racism that I've ever had. And it's, and it's not like I process them all at the same time every time they ask me the question. It's not like I remember one specific one. Some are conscious and some are subconscious. But this is a time where people really want to know how I'm doing. And for the first time, I felt like my life really matters to people who aren't like me who aren't black. And that feels good in some way because people show that they really care, but there's a lot of grieving and mourning that's happening beyond what happened to George Floyd because of 300 years of slavery. And that never really was addressed in this country. And so when you ask me, how are you? It's like, well, <laughs> I'm, I'm grieving, I'm mourning, I'm, I'm processing what's happened to me. I'm grateful for all of the people who've reached out and said, I'm just thinking about you. I'm thankful that so many people have stepped up to help and get involved and take action in whatever way um, works for them and makes sense for them. And I'm optimistic that this moment is going to be written in history in a, in a good way for our culture and our community. And the reason why I say the last piece is not because 
of what I know, what my mother lived in the 60s and saw prior civil rights movements happening. And for her, she says, this is different. Everybody all over the world is showing up and, and taking a stand and putting their voices out there. All of the allies that we've ever had are speaking up and standing up in front. And that's, and that's wonderful. And so when I hear her say that, then I really do believe that this will be one of the most important moments that uh, we will experience and write about in history. And that's all on top of a pandemic and an economic recession. And so, you know, everybody here is going through some form of emotional trauma right now. And sometimes it's like bad and sometimes it's good. I'm happy to be around my kids, but I'm nervous. They're going to bang on this door in a second and want to like talk to me like in the middle of this webinar. <laughs> um, okay if that happens. Yeah. Um, but, and so, so the emotional trauma of all that we're dealing with is on top of our roles and responsibilities as leaders. And so it's forced me to not just think about how I'm doing, but manage my own energy around it. And I'm sure many of you are going through the same thing. So. How do you, I, I, I'm glad to hear you say, particularly your mom, who's so sweet, the sweetest person, <laughs> people in the world, that she sees this as a different moment in time as well. And she's lived through and seen other movements. And so that I think is a great thing and is, you know, gives us all hope. How do you think that we can continue to just capitalize on this momentum and just make sure, right, that this is something that is part of history and is a changing point? Like, what can we all do to make that happen? Yeah, um, everybody's wondering what what the what the right answer to that question is and and there really isn't one thing we as leaders have to lead differently um as a parent if you're a parent you have to talk to your kids about race kids understand race at the age of age two two so to think that they don't see it or they don't know it is wrong they do they just they just don't see it in the way that some people in the world see it, but they see it. And, and so as parents, we have to educate. For those of us who are privileged, white privileged, you have to educate yourself on what that means. What does that actually mean? What does it mean to you? And then how much, what is your role in acting in that way? Um, we have to change laws. Many of the things that led to George Floyd's death are tied to systemic racism, which are systemic effectively means that there were laws that written that allow for certain behaviors to happen and that nobody did anything about. And so we have to change laws. So if you are not registered to vote, you have to vote. If you care about redistricting, you have to Go and, and advocate for that and, and vote at the local levels. So there's so many things that we have to do. But the, the most important thing that if you're running a company, you can do is to acknowledge that there's racism in your company. And it's not because you created it. It's because the people that you hired come with whatever they have into the company. And nobody leaves all of themselves at the door. And so having the conversation about your culture and how you want the company to be represented and how you want to hire, develop, create inclusion policies and lead is one of the most tangible things that you can do right now. Yeah, I think that's on a lot of CEOs' minds right now, on a lot of founders' minds. Um, let's talk a little bit about just culture inside of a company and, you know, that starts with hiring. It starts with values. Um, you know, what are your sort of, 
um, perspectives and ideas and advice to founders and CEOs right now around specifically creating that culture. You can't let culture create itself, right? You and I have talked a lot about this. Um, you have to be explicit about it. Mm -hmm. So what are some steps that founders can think about taking either from a hiring standpoint or a value standpoint that you feel like could really help shape a culture in a way that is positive and, and that supports this and moving forward? Yeah, um, when we uh, when we got acquired by IKEA in in 2017, we redid the values, and it's not because we didn't love the values that you created, Leah. It, it was, and in fact, like we all believed them, we all lived them, we all loved them. But we redid the values because we were entering a new era for the company and we wanted people to anchor into something and so if we ended up with the exact same list that would have been fine but just going through the process of redoing the values and re-looking at the values was something that brought everybody together and so i would recommend that even if you've already written your values down you should just redo them just take a look at them again and just ask yourself given what we've gone through a pandemic an economic recession and a social justice movement like are these the right things to have on the page or not and and if the answer is yes great but if the answer is like let's tweak one of these things then go ahead and tweak it and change it and come up with the with what you think is going to matter now more than it did you know two weeks ago uh, four months ago, six months ago, even as we started this decade. So that's one piece of advice I would have. The other is thinking about what are the ways, I'm in a meeting, girls. I'll be back. Okay, hold on for just one second. I knew this was gonna happen. in <laughs> there. My kids busted in on a webinar with Vu and Draper. It was like 800 attendees, and they pounded down the door. All right, I apologize for that. She, my other daughter, is doing jewelry making, and she made jewelry for the younger one, and the jewelry was in here, so she had to get it. So yeah. necessary, it's necessary right now. Um, but so I think the second piece of advice is on. You know, once you have your values and you love your values, just what are the things, what are the systems that you put in place to make sure you're living those values? And so we've done some tactical things like when we do performance reviews, we ask a question of how have you lived the values? And for a peer review, we ask people to write, how has this person lived the values? Can you write that down? And then when we think about promotions and merit increases, we look at the total performance of, of someone, including how they live, how they live the values of the company. Um, we also have a culture rockstar award that is employee nominated that is based on the values. And so it's a way to sort of highlight the importance of them in a very public way in the company. Um, so people, when people start to use the vocabulary, we talk about caring deeply because that's one of the values and they talk about it all the time. Then you know it's not just the words that you wrote on the paper, but that it is something that's embedded in the, the actual culture of the, of the company. And then when you do that, then I think Leah, you get to the place where your values do reflect the kind of company that you want to build and in this moment that's so essential <clears throat> i love that i love that you redid the values and got everyone <laughs> re bought in for new yeah. it's so cool yeah. um what about let's talk about the people for a moment and hiring and you know a lot of our companies are early stage they're small teams they're under 20 people or you know they're just a couple of white male founders right like we have one question that's like from the group that's like we're two founders we're both white men like how should we be thinking about growing our team right now with the constraints that we have we believe this is important like what can we do on a small team 
to get started on the right foot to build a diverse culture, to build a diverse team. So how do you think about just like building the team and hiring yeah. and what are some tactics that, you know, you've done at TaskRabbit that's aided with that? Yeah, I, when you're two people, it's different than when you're 200 people to sort of think about, you know, what the options are, what you can do. Um, we've done some intentional things like create internship programs with just uh, minorities who participate in engineering, um, a program called Code 2040. Um, we've partnered with an organization called Dev Color, which you might want to reach out to because they, uh, it's just a network of black engineers effectively who are all professionals in their career who spend time together on a variety of different topics. Uh, many of them are gay, like employed and happy in their jobs, but a lot of them, um, uh, Zuri, I will be out in a half an hour and I can look at your earrings. Not right now, okay? Not right now. Um, okay, I'll see them later. And so we've done those programs and those programs are like hard to do when you're two people. But if you have like 10 people, you can definitely get an intern from Code 2040, right? So there's, you know, don't think you have to be Google or Facebook or whatever to participate in some of these things. But all, underneath all of this is the importance of reaching out and expanding your network. Um, figuring out like, what does our network look like? Like how many, people do we interact with that don't look like us? And then how can we change what that looks like? So I would certainly do that. And if you happen to work with recruiters, require that they bring a diverse slate of candidates to the table. And if you're not, if they can't do that, then you can go work with someone else. There are a ton of recruiters out there and it's not like there's one that's way better than the other one. And making that a requirement is, is one of the best ways that you can help source diverse candidates. Um, I was on a, I was in a conversation yesterday with someone about um, hiring and they asked this question and the framing I'll share with you that came up is the following. A lot of people worry about quotas. Well, we don't want to have a quota because that's bad. We don't want to like, allocate a certain number to women and a certain number to black people because that's bad. Uh, but the, the better way to think about it is, is targets. You set a revenue target, you set a growth target, you set a budget, you set a hiring target. So why can't this just be a target that you set and you work towards and you measure people against hitting that target? There's a company that um, if you don't bring in anybody diverse into the company over the course of your year, it impacts your performance rating, which impacts your bonus. Now, this is a very large company, publicly traded, so they need like a bigger system in place. But if you start to think about it like a target, well, why can't you have, you can have targets and set those targets. It changes behavior. I love that. I love that way of thinking about it. You have all these other targets you're measured against. Yes. Do you have, um, or have you thought about having someone own those targets or, or KPIs around pipeline or diversity or hiring? How do you think about that? Yeah, we, we don't have a head of diversity at TaskRabbit. Uh, many companies do. These should be owned by the hiring manager. They should own the target. So of course, people operations or HR, however you describe it in your team, those people will help staff and administer, but the ownership of the target is the hiring manager for the team. If you run engineering, you have a target for the number of black engineers you should have, the number of female engineers you should have, and this is what you're gonna be measured against. And when you put the responsibility and the accountability with the hiring manager, who also has a target for shipping the product, it really changes the focus and the priority and the importance of diversity. Mm -hmm. Yep, I love that. So once you've built a diverse team and a diverse culture, how do you continue to cultivate that and celebrate that? And people have different backgrounds and different personalities and 
you know, mm. they come from different walks of life. How do you ensure that everyone feels a part of the team, feels comfortable, um, you know, is communicating well? Are there different stories or instances or scenarios that you've hit that you feel like are good examples of learnings there? Yeah, I, I, um, I, we've always had, and even the first day I walked into the building at TaskRabbit, I felt this, which was like, I just felt welcomed. Um, I just felt like I was at home and every, all of me was allowed to come into the room. And so there's something about the values and the culture that will create that kind of environment for your team. And so it starts there. But you also need ways of communication that allow for dialogue and discussion to happen. It's very hard right now in some ways because most of us are remote and we're looking at each other on Zoom um, to, to create that connection that we want. Um, and it's easy to misunderstand. And so over communicating is something that I recommend. Repetition does not spoil the prayer. And then having open dialogue uh, and being a willing and able to do that. I thought that we were really good at having open dialogue. Everybody can bring their whole self to work. And, you know, and we've gotten lots of feedback, even in our engagement surveys about the inclusiveness of the culture at TaskRabbit. We have affinity groups and a variety of things. But we hosted two town halls a couple weeks ago following the death of George Floyd. And we had, you know, a hundred or so people in, in each one. Um, and then we broke up into small groups of six to eight people. And there was a level of sharing that happened in those town halls that has never, ever happened in the seven years that I've been at this company. Mm. And so there's something about what's happening right now where we think even if we think we have an inclusive culture and we think we have, you know, a way for people to fully express themselves, there's a part of us that's not fully there. And so I would really encourage you all to create those environments. There's a company called Paradigm that's very good at this and they can facilitate a discussion if you are uncomfortable doing it. We did it ourselves. We sort of made it up. <laughs> We're like, let's try it. And it worked out really well. Um, so I think these small group dialogues are something that we're going to continue doing. And we've learned is a really good way, especially within these remote environments, to foster inclusive and inclusive culture. That's, that's a great idea. That's great feedback. Hey, Leah, just a couple questions coming in. There's Great. some energy around learning more about the affinity groups that you mentioned, Stacey, as well as mm -hmm. the small group dialogues, um, mm -hmm. sharing more details on how you set those up and how they're executed. Yeah, great. Uh, so affinity groups, we, pre we started, I would say, in earnest in January. We kind of piloted some things at the end of last year. And just for, for reference, we have about 200 employees at TaskRabbit, so just so you know how, what we're working with in terms of scale. Um, and those affinity groups, there's a whole list of, of them that were really employee, you know, nominated. There's some obvious ones like the Black Affinity Group, we call ourselves TR Noir, and you know, there's our Pride Group, there's a Veterans Group, uh, but there's also the introverts, right? They're, they they created a group, and so we have an interfaith, uh, non-denominational group. So there's a lot of groups that people sort of employee nominated and created. And then we had our people ops team come in and help with some structure on okay, if you're going to be an affinity group, we need somebody to sort of champion it from the senior leadership team. Uh, we need somebody to be responsible for kind of pulling the group together and communicating in Slack and email and and then you need, you know, you need to sort of form a mission statement. What are you, what are you here for? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, and then we let you run with, with that. We create some budget. You can come ask for budget and you can, you know, launch different initiatives. But I think doing these things from the, the bottoms up and the ground up is way better than tops down because you get the energy of the team involved in a in an area that they care about and then other people get involved the asians of tr of task rabbit they like cooking asian food so that's what their group that's their mission 
and that's what they want to do. Um, it, it really does allow you to get to know people in a different way, but it also creates a lot of engagement in the company, which leads to um, retention. Uh, on, the, on the small groups, we, we facilitated an open discussion, and I'm happy to send the template because we borrowed it from somebody else. It was just a question of, you know, how has this moment impacted you? And, and I opened up with, you know, five or 10 minutes or so of my own experience being a black female CEO. Um, and then we went through some ground rules, very much like we did for this conversation, we went through some ground rules. And then we had people break up into the small groups. And the first question was, how are you? And you have two minutes to talk about it. And if you just are quiet for two minutes, that's fine. But to give people the space to sort of go beyond the surface answer to how are you, just led into just a deeper discussion. And then we had the follow-up question of what is this moment meant to you? Um, what can, how can we support each other in this moment? And then what can TaskRabbit do to support you? Because we were trying to get some ideas on organizations that we should donate to and a variety of things. Um, and and the, the group that I was in, we didn't even get past the how are you? Because people were sharing stories of their own experience around racism. And sometimes it was because they had someone in their life who was black and they saw something happen that they never did anything about and wanted to talk about that and have a lot of emotions around it. And sometimes it was some other racist experience that they encountered that was coming up for them and resonating for them. Um, it was a very powerful discussion and a very powerful way to get to know people at a deeper level. Um, Stacy, do you think and a budget is <laughs> coming from young companies? Is the budget necessary for the infinity groups, or is it more this organic getting together? And how many of those groups actually leverage a budget? Would you say? I so Tia Noir has not actually asked for any money <laughs> yet. I was thinking to myself because I'm like the I'm like the champion, so it have to go through me. You don't really need a budget. Um, We've done like chats, we did a speaker on, you know, meditation um, and like the black community and mental health because it like mental health in the black community is, a, is like a non-discussable in a, in a way. And so we had a whole discussion about that. We've done a movie night, we watched Harriet. Like you don't have to, you don't have to actually have uh, a budget and it really is about people coming up with ideas and coming together the pride team we do things around pride every year so they probably i think that's the one group that probably leverages the budget more than anybody else yeah. <laughs> nice so stacy you mentioned you know being able to share your experience as a black ceo as a black female ceo I was chatting with Jamie and Chris in preparation for this, and I was thinking about experiences you and I have had together um, mm. at TaskRabbit, whether it be, you know, pitching an investor or, or, you know, maybe I remember this one time we were at a first round capital event with Kim Scott. Do you remember mm. the swap on Radical Candor? Yes, yes. And she, you know, she was talking about the importance of just being super direct and super, um, you know, uh, uh, clear and transparent. And, and I think she asked the audience, like, how does that make you feel? Or, you know, how would you do that? And I remember you saying, as a black woman, I have to be even more careful about mm -hmm. what I say and how I say it. And I remember her at the time, a little bit brushing you off to the side. Um, and she was like, oh, that's a whole nother thing. Like, we just don't even have time to get into right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I was thinking about, were there times when you and I were together that I witnessed something or experienced something? But I thought it'd be an interesting question for you. And, mm -hmm. you know, CEO now, but even as COO, mm -hmm. you know, what has your experience truly been in realizing that, you know, my experience and my perspective 
like I probably overlook things or didn't see things or things yeah. probably hit you in a different way with different contexts. And I was just super interested in like, now as we look back and like we, our eyes are more open and they need to be more open. Like what were those moments? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, Kim actually did follow up after that. And when she did the next version of her book, she talked about that. I don't know if you've noticed, but she, um, so I think I do remember saying that to her and she did follow up about that. She and I were friends, you know, from Google and um, has spent a bunch of time together. And I, the angry black woman phenomenon is certainly, um, is still there. And, and that's what we were effectively talking about. I would say, you know, how do I answer your question? There's a lot of things about being black that you just will never appreciate because you're not. And it's not just, I'm not trying to get out of the answer. And I'll give you a different example, Leah, and I hope I'm not revealing too much here. But when I um, was pregnant with Zuri, and that's when, you know, I was at TaskRabbit and I had this moment of like, just like lashing out one day. And like, I think, I don't know what happened, but like somebody told you and you came to me and were like, Stacy, like you got to take it down. I was like, I'm emotional, I'm pregnant. Like, you know, I was like, I think I yelled. I think I was like angry black woman from Detroit that day. Like, I was like that girl. Um, but I was very pregnant, very emotional. And you talked to me about it and you were like, you know, you got, you can't. And I said, I'm, I know, I'm sorry. And, and I thought to myself, like one day when she has children, she will understand what I'm talking about. And sure enough, when you were pregnant, you had those moments. <laughs> I'm having it right now. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. And you don't, you don't know what that's like until you actually go through it. Like until you know what it's like to have an emotional moment as a seven month pregnant person, like you just don't know. And as a woman, you empathized with me. It was a great conversation. You just don't know. And so I'm saying that is that there's just a lot that it's, I, I can't, I can't give you, I can't impart to you because you just, you just won't know. You won't know what it's like to be afraid when you see a police officer because they could kill you. Like you just won't know what that, what that feels like. But there were, there are times when we were fundraising where, you know, we definitely got shorter conversations. Um, a lot of times people would ask you questions that I had the answer to. Um, and like redirect it, like that was really difficult to go through. Uh, when you left and I took over as CEO, my COO was a white man and the same thing happened in the fundraising process where I'm the CEO now and you know, he would get the questions and, and so that happens. The other microaggressions are like the shock and surprise at how articulate I am. Why wouldn't I be? Mm -hmm. I'm a CEO. The shock and surprise of, oh, you're a CEO of a, co what company? Really? Wow, right? Like there's just like something so awesome about it. And the tone of awesomeness isn't like they're proud of me. They're, the tone is like shock and awe. Some of those things are, you know, that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're living in a world where you would never do it yourself, other people subconsciously are doing those things and I hear them and I feel them. Yeah. It's a long answer, but I wanted no, to kind of, yeah. I remember that day too, uh, when you were pregnant. And then I remember later when I was pregnant and had the <laughs> on my so <laughs> it's, a good yes. it's a good analogy. Um, are there other questions, Jamie, from the audience? Yeah, a couple. Okay. Um, so one is diversity is a nice to have, not a must have. I put that in quotes. Mm -hmm. um, during a crisis, and especially during a period that we're going through, um, a recession. 
How do you recommend that companies stay focused on driving DNI even during a recession and potentially layoffs and cutting back yeah. on staff? Um, I have the fortunate experience of being on the Gavin Newsom's, Governor Newsom's task force. There's a task force he's created like reopen the state and it's like a hundred people and they really, they really are trying to get our input and, you know, ask us to be helpful. And as people from across private sector, public sector, academia, government, nonprofits. And they, so I get to see some, some interesting data. And one of the most interesting pieces of data that I've seen that I always knew is that when you're in a recession, the income inequality gap increases disproportionately more for minorities. In the case of California, black people, Latin people, and Native Americans. And so it, it, it actually cannot be a nice to have during a recession because what you effectively are doing is making the people who are already worse off even more worse off than they would have been. More black people and Hispanic and Native Americans have been laid off as part of what's happening with the pandemic than, than white people. And so when you say, well, it's a nice to have because I've got to really focus on the people who can do a good job, or I've got to really focus on um, you know, hiring the best person, you are by definition increasing the income inequality gap for the population that is the most impacted by this recession right now. Um, so I just needed to say that because I don't think that I had understood it that way. I kind of knew because the communities that I grew up in, but when you see the data, it's very powerful and it's very telling. Hmm. That is very telling. Interesting. What about switching gears a little bit when founders and CEOs are thinking about not their teams, but their customers. Okay. Mm. Um, and whether their products are, we have some marketplace companies where, you know, there's two sides like TaskRabbit with a lot of different types of customers. We have some companies that are more direct to consumer plays, right? So customers are buying products. How, what is your advice to, to founders and CEOs that are dealing with customers that may not hold the same values, that may be racist, that may be outright, mm. just not people that they would want to be dealing with? I mean, what do you do? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's tough when you have consumers and that's a, that's a hard one. I mean, we obviously have people who use TaskRabbit who come from all walks of life and we want to be the kind of company that accepts everyone. Um, but we have to stand for something. So we've sent out community. If you are a TaskRabbit user, you got an email from me at some point just about what we're doing and why we're doing it and what we care about. Um, and I think it's important as leaders to put that out there. And while you can't change a customer's behavior, you can tell them what your values are and that may help them decide like i don't want to shop with you i don't want to use your service and that's okay because we don't want people who don't want to in fact a lot of the trend is that people want to buy from brands that are standing for something and so if you're worried about cutting off a certain type of customer base because you're taking a stand in fact it's the opposite taking a stand is the most important thing that you can do. Um, if you have partners, you know, ask the question. We, as you know, Leah, but others may not, we have a tasker council. We are re-evaluating the diversity of that tasker council. We have black people in that council already, but we're gonna look at the whole thing all over again. It was like, let's re-look at the tasker council. This is the group that we should be talking to. When we look at you know, our product feature updates we're doing on the client side, who are we talking to? What customer base are we talking to? And we're going to be looking at that again, too, because how we build the products matters as much as how the customers experience the products and who's involved in that process matters, too. And so if you have counsels, for those of you who have consumer products, you probably have 
some counsels to help you think about the customer's experience and the customer journey, make sure those counsels are diverse. <clears throat> That's a great piece of feedback. Other questions, Jamie? Yeah, another one coming in is, what do you do if your culture feels broken currently? What steps can you take Ooh. to remedy it? Oh, um, yeah, this is like an easy question to answer because usually it's like a few people mm. and then you just got to get in there and just root those people out. That's really the answer. Um, yeah. 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 Bring them out, reset. Yeah. Redo the reset. Work. Um, another one is now that we're all focused on Black Lives Matter, how do you ensure that other minority groups within the organization feel included? We talked a little bit about your affinity groups, but how do you feel like um, those groups aren't neglected as we go through all this? Mm. Yeah, I, um, you know, we were, uh, we've had, a, we've had some moments like that as we've gone through our decision-making process on what organizations we were gonna support. And one of the, um, one of the comment came up, which was, well, you know, should we expand the organizations that we're giving to? And I said, no, because this is not about those people. And it's not that we don't care about them, this is about Black Lives Matter right now. And it's not like we've forgotten that other lives matter. What we are saying right now is this, and this is the stand that we're taking. And I hope that hearing that, if I'm in another group, it's like, well, so when I'm in my moment, like TaskRap is gonna be there for me. They're gonna like show up and they're gonna like focus and care about a cause that really matters to me. And so, the intent here that I've tried to convey, which may be helpful, is that this is not at the exclusion of other people. This is an area of focus that we have right now. One thing that we did do was we looked at, in some of the organizations we decided to give to that we'll eventually make public, um, was there was one around LGBTQ and specifically around transgender and the black community. And someone said, well, you know what? This is a really important organization because this issue is on top of being black and here's why. And so that was one, okay, great. Like let's, let's also, you know, um, allow for a contribution to that organization too. And so I don't think that it's not an intent to include everybody because once you start doing that, then you lose focus. But if there are ways to do overlap, like, great, do that too. And hopefully people feel like if you're focusing right now on one group, there's, if there's an issue that comes up with my community, my, my affinity group, like you're gonna rally around, everybody else is gonna rally around us too. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point because it's like, if we all just take this momentum and this moment to focus on this, on this thing, like that's how you push something over yes. the edge, right? It's like if you spread yeah. yourself too thin, then the results become watered down across a lot of different areas. Like now is the time to just, God, if we can just get everyone to focus, um, that we really make a difference. I want to open it up to the group chat as well. If there are folks that want to unmute and pop on and say hello to Stacy and ask a question, just want to invite that for the next few minutes or so. And it's quite easy. You just have to unmute yourself. I don't have to unmute you. Yeah. Um, and maybe as people are thinking about their questions, we can, we can keep going too. Um, so what do you see as sort of the opportunity? Like what is, what is next, particularly as we think about like our industry and the tech industry as an example, like what do you want to see happen? Um, because I think if we can put into words or put, put into a vision of like, where do we want to see everyone going? Like mm -hmm. if we all face in the same direction, right? Like we can get there faster. So like, can you say just a few words about like, you know, we've talked about this moment in time. We've talked about how it's different. 
like let's talk about where we're going um, yeah 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 so, I, so this is as much a you know social justice moment as it is issue as it as it is an economic equity issue and tech is the tech industry is one of the greatest creators of wealth above any other industry um, in our society. And so I would like to see more participation and more diverse participation in wealth creation. And therefore, we need to have that representation in the tech industry. So thank you for the donation to Black Girls Code. I have my Black Girls Code t-shirt on today. I wore it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Cause that's one organization that is changing the face of tech and starting at the early stages where girls are still in the process of deciding how they wanna pursue their careers and, and where they wanna to go to college and their education. But it is really about changing the face of changing the face of tech. And so I think that we have been innovative in so many ways. We sent a rocket into space a few weeks ago. Like we can do this, people. We just have to sit down, put some targets on it, and make it happen. Yeah, I love that. And not only as founders and CEOs, I mean investors need to step up too. We need to be seeking out, you know, those founders that are underrepresented, that have great ideas, that may not have been given the same opportunities or the same path um, mm -hmm. to Silicon Valley as everyone else. And so I just, that's something I'm really passionate about too, is like, if we all just really do our part and like mm -hmm. you said, set the targets and like, just really do the work, like that's how, that's how things change. Yeah, cool. All right, one last question. Any last questions and then we'll let Stacy go so Zuri can show her, her earrings. <laughs> <laughs> Very patient. She's, she'll be a CEO someday. We'll look back on this recording when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good. I think we're all set. So I just want to say thanks to Stacey for your time. This has been so incredibly helpful. Thank you everybody who's joined. What we'll do is send out the recording plus some notes from the conversation um, probably early next week. So look for that and feel free to share with your organizations as well. Awesome. Thank everybody. you so much, Stacey. This was a great Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Bye. Bye.